drive. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> I thought a good place to start was really just to start our conversation today about asking about light boxes and transparencies. Um, it was a new media when Jeff took it up in the 70s, and it's quite a unique media. So perhaps you could just maybe a little bit talk us about what intrigued you about illuminated photographs. Well, in the, in the uh, beginning of the 70s, I had no really clear idea of how I could accomplish something for myself as an, as an artist. I'd been a painter and as a child and as an adolescent and had kind of drifted away from that in the 60s for a lot of probably quite familiar reasons. If you can think back to what the period of the 60s was like, that is that experimentation was the order of the day and painting seemed somehow beside the point. And even though I was really attached to it, I went with the times being a young person. And, uh, and in that process, kind of lost my way for a number of years. And went through experiments in kind of uh, conceptual and post-conceptual art and things like that, and really had no success at all in that sort of thing. And by the time I started really thinking about photography um, in, in a kind of an engaged way, it was already in the middle of the 70s. And I felt that uh, photography as I knew it, and as everyone knew it at that time, uh, was a kind of a closed door for me. I think even in the middle of the 70s, photography as an art was still dominated by the documentary aesthetic, the documentary notion of photography. And although that was a great and permanent aspect of photography, um, I couldn't see my way into it because it didn't feel new anymore to me. It didn't feel at that time that the documentary notion of what photography should be as art was new. It had had a hundred years or so of being new, and, uh, I, and I think that it had come to a point where someone like me could experience it differently. And um, that kind of opened the door to imagining alternatives in photography. And there were a lot of people um, at that time trying things out with the medium of photography, trying color, trying to deploy their prints in different ways, um, combining photographs with other things, experimenting with scale. Um, I'm sure a really interesting exhibition could be held about the transformation of photography, of photography from about 1968 to about 1980, and it would be a, a, obviously a very big exhibition. Some of the people in it might not be familiar names anymore. In any case, that was the context where I began to think about alternatives to, to classical photography. And I wanted to work larger, I wanted to work in color, and I got interested in the expulsion of artifice, or the, the fact that artifice had been somewhat expelled from the main idea of what photography could, should be for a long time. I can't really explain you quickly enough why I felt that way, but it seemed to me uh, a dimension of the medium that had been let drop. And it, well, that made me feel like there was potential, there were potentials inside of the medium of photography that weren't really being addressed at that moment. So I was casting about for a way to make a picture that would be um, a kind of tableau, that is, it would, as you see in the show, uh, hang on the wall in a very singular way and be confronted the way a painting could be confronted. It should be in color if necessary. And um, I was casting around trying to find a medium, a photographic print medium that could do it. None of the existing uh, print types of that time seemed to be what I wanted. Remember, this is 1975, 1976 quite different from today. And, and the man in the lab uh, asked me if I'd ever considered the transparent uh, stuff that they were using for advertising. And of course, I hadn't. So he showed me some tests. And uh, then I began to feel like this was a, an interesting alternative to making opaque prints. So um, you know, it kind of came out of all the problems I was having as an artist for the last 15 years, on the one hand. 
and a kind of an accident or a circumstance of talking to the right person in the right lab at the right time. On the other hand, it was never a plan. But once I started working with them, I discovered that they had qualities that were interesting because no one was really, ex no one was really working very much with them, so it was a fresh field. It also had a non-art look to it. And I think that as a person who came from the 50s and 60s, during a time during which one of the ambitions of artists was to make art that didn't look like art, um, that was also a factor, that it really didn't seem like art photography at all. Can you talk a bit about the role of memory um, as you consider incidents and situations you've come across and ultimately decide to make or not make a picture? I've said, I've said many times that um, I begin by not photographing something. I mean, I could photograph it, I could carry a camera like the so-called ordinary photographer does, but I don't do that. I, I like to let things pass without photographing them. And in the act of renunciation of photographing, I've always found a space that opened for me, that allowed me to do something that I felt was right for me. Of course, that's not a rule that can be applied in any way. It's just something I like to do. But the negative space, if you want to think about it that way, the, the void that's opened by the not photographing, by the letting something pass without having been photographed, creates another relation to the event and another kind of image. And that free, there's a certain freedom in that that I find very important. So once you've decided to make a photograph, often, not all of them, but a number of the <coughs> photographs, uh, and many in this exhibition, actually include people, and some are the result of a brief performance made vi visible by the actions of your, of your collaborators, people you work with. Um, how do you go about making this type of photograph? What's called the cinemagraphic, I suppose. I don't know that I want to tell you that. Um, <laughs> In the, well, old, in the old days, uh, when artists' studios were these secluded spaces that were jealously guarded and contained secrets and private knowledge and also hard-earned knowledge that people had to learn by hard practice over long periods of time, the people in those studios didn't give that stuff away because it was really hard won. And, um, and I, kind of, I sort of feel that way to a certain extent because um, uh, I don't have any methods. I don't have any guidelines and I have to sort of find my way every time I try and do something. Of course, there are things I do all the time. I'm mostly really talking about, I suppose, how film has influenced your work and the, the role that you have with people you collaborate with and how you admire, I guess, in other cinematographies or people who make film. Well, yes, and I'll just say one last thing on my last point is that the other side of the coin is we've probably all seen the films of a, of a painter working on his painting and um, documentary films and those are really often really interesting. People will always like to watch a painter make a painting because it's sort of inherently fascinating how he or she makes it bit by bit. I think that people will even stop and watch someone paint a wall um, and we know this episode in Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer where he's painting a fence and Tom's painting a fence and he eventually gets other people to paint it for him because they find it so fascinating and they want to do it themselves. Painting is inherently fascinating to watch happen. It, there's nothing more uninteresting than watch a photographer photograph. <laughs> there's nothing to see. And so that's another reason why it's, in a way it's pointless to describe what one does when one's photographing. You already know what happens. Something happens in front of the camera and the photographer clicks the shutter and it's done. Um, there's nothing more to it than that on that level. But cinematography is a term I began to use at some point in the past to acknowledge to myself, if not to others, that um, in the cinema there's a complex way of doing photography that I found very fascinating, even though I, n I never really wanted to be a filmmaker. That is that, um, you know, in films, people 
have to prepare a lot of things to get whatever it is they're doing, more or less elaborate, depending on what the film in question is. But whatever it is, they bring together a whole complex of, of activities, whether it's working with performers somehow, inventing spaces that haven't existed before they wanted them to, uh, working with the actual equipment, transforming it, adapting it, and all that sort of thing. And I felt that that was somehow excluded from photography uh, back at the beginning by this documentary norm. And um, that also seemed to me, that method seemed to be more akin to the other arts, like painting or sculpture, um, like theater. All the other arts have the capacity to construct plastic, in a plastic sequence of uh, activities, something and bring it to a conclusion somehow. And inside of documentary photography, that was rigorously excluded for a long time because what one did was take the world as it is completed and occurring and capture it on the fly. And that is a great kind of photography, but I, as I said before, I didn't feel it was the only kind of photography that was significant. And because that didn't feel new, it seemed like these liaisons between the arts felt new. Remember that people who championed photography for a long time insisted on its distinction from the other arts and how it wasn't anything like the other arts that came before and that was what it should focus on. And they were right up to a point. But for me it seemed quite the opposite, that it was the connections between the arts that became more interesting again and led to a kind of approach that I called cinematographic later. And I realized that cinematography is just uh, an approach to photography. It doesn't have anything to do necessarily with filmmaking. But of course, filmmaking is the place where you mostly see it. Um, so I'm interested in the way films are photographed, how they look, how uh, they're done, and the kind of means and attitudes that um, people who do that sort of work bring to it. And I've tried to sort of some ways imitate that to a certain extent in the making of what I do. You continue to shoot on film in I suppose what's now described as the digital age and although not exclusively or you you do have a, a fondness for large format cameras and if, has that been kind of you still feel that film is important using that as a medium? The technology of film is unique it has something that is uh, incomparable. I won't go into detail about it except to say that it seems like a very bad idea and I'm desperately hoping and um, lobbying where I can to encourage the manufacturers of film to keep manufacturing it. There's simply no reason why the digital and the analogic cannot coexist. But we're into one of those phases where everyone started to think the same way and everyone's mind is pointing in the same direction and suddenly there's a blinkering going on that suggests that film is this useless, outmoded technology that has no part to play in the modern world. Um, so of course I have freezers full of film um, because I cannot trust Kodak or anybody else to keep uh, manufacturing the stuff. So um, I wouldn't use it, I suppose, if I didn't feel strongly that it had its own qualities that are inimitable. And even when I use the computer later to scan the film uh, and make montages or whatever I might do with it, I still can see very clearly the, um, the character of the original material. So I'm very attached to photography as a, as a technique, a medium, um, a technology, I suppose, an institution. and. Um, and it, I feel it is a kind of a crisis for anyone who has inter interest in the pictorial um, capacities of the medium. This is not, again, there's no criticism of digital imaging because that's also great, but the two really have somewhat different things to offer, at least at this point. Another term you've used to describe your work is, is near documentary, and I tend to understand from that that they're, they're pictures that you come to make 
when you try to kind of recollect that experience that you didn't photograph, it could be a feeling, an emotion, as precisely as you can. What we call documentary was most precisely articulated by Walker Evans when he just made a, distingu a distinction between documentary photography by what she meant the photographic creation of documents for use and what he called the documentary style, which is what he practiced. He considered that he worked in the documentary style. That is, an artistic style that resembled a document and could, under certain circumstances, even perform as a document and contain information, but not determine by the information transferring character of the document. So, so Evans's idea of documentary style is, in a way, the, one of the foundations of any aesthetic notion about how to deal with the special nature of photography. And, and it's one of the outcomes of Evans's practice. So um, I don't do that, though. I do something called near documentary, which is, to go back to what I said earlier, has to do with the loss that is incurred when you don't photograph something. So my pictures all kind of stand in the shadow of some imaginary object that was never photographed, but still, having disappeared, leaves a space. And I don't really have the means to explain why I like that space. I think it has something to do with poetry. I think it has something to do with symbolism. I think it has something to do with the idea that art should be occult somehow, should not be immediately available um, to perception, that there should be some kind of um, dialectic operating, that what you see is and is not actual. Um, it comes from my interest in literature, I think. I like the term occultation. It's a term that the Surrealists originally used to suggest that what art needed to do was to withdraw from its public and not to be so available, to make it difficult to be seen, to make the art hard to see, even though it's in plain sight, to create a dynamic where the art is vanishing from you while you look at it, that it is looking back at you while you're looking at it, and it creates difficulties for you whilst it creates enjoyment. And um, I think that's why, that's what the, the space of not photographing kind of means to me. And because it's, it's like that, it's a kind of a free space, a subjectively free space. Because once you enter it, you can do anything with it. So if I should see some occurrence um, and don't photograph it, I've already transformed my relationship as a photographer to it. And the result is incalculable. It's unpredictable. And I see that as a kind of um, um, gesture of personal freedom somehow. And inside of that, then, I feel I have certain I take on certain obligations. Because if you are living in it, if you take, make a gesture to free yourself from any constraint, then you immediately impose new obligations on yourself to act appropriately. And then the acting appropriately becomes a series of aesthetic judgments about what you're to do in a state of freedom. And that results in a picture which one hopes has been made in a spirit of freedom in that way I'm describing it. And that contains enjoyment in itself. And so that whole dialectic matters. So near documentary is a place where you, what I call some of, the, it's a style. It's a, it, it's a part of cinematography, but it has to do with the remembering of something, freeing oneself from it, creating a responsibility or obligation toward it, and then carrying out the act of picture making in that kind of space. It is all sort of upside down, curved and backwards, which I like. That's what I like about it. It doesn't approach you directly. Maybe a couple of pictures in the show um, that it would be interesting to talk about, because I know they started in situations that are quite different from where the photograph ended up. Um, one might be, let's say, knife throw, which mm -hmm. obviously, I'm assuming, like most of the other photographs, was something you came across. But I know you actually started producing that picture outside, and it's clearly not outside now. Yes, I saw some young people 
kind of like the ones you see in my picture, throwing knives into a tree stump. And I thought it was the action of knife throwing was interesting. The wasting time, developing a skill that was fundamentally useless, um, that had no utilitarian possibilities. Um, maybe that was something to do with it. I'm kind of fascinated by the capacity that we have to waste knowledge, skill, talent, youth on futile um, enterprises that usually end in failure. And there's something beautiful about that, something tragic about that sort of behavior. And it often is just, it's not seen in a big way, in a tragic way, but it's seen often in a microcosmic way as a, just a, a glimmer of this, this uh, way of being. Maybe that's the kind of thing that caught my eye. So uh, whatever it was, I'm just trying to ponder it a bit. Uh, and I didn't photograph it, of course. Then, because it wasn't photographed, it didn't need to be a tree stump anymore. Uh, it didn't need to be this person or that person. There didn't need to be five or three or four. It didn't need to be anything. It was just a knife being thrown in a condition of something like I would, what I just described to you. So then you see it becomes plastic. Everything is plastic. The space that you're going to photograph hasn't come to be yet. It could be built. It could be found. It could be conjured somehow. The people's bodies haven't yet appeared there to be found. The knife hasn't existed yet. Everything is, in a sense, open to being made some way. Um, and you can choose. So I chose to do it as realistically and authentically as I could and accidentally found this particular old abandoned building and could work in it, got access to it, could work in it, found people uh, who were very like the original people, found a way to work with them, um, and then sort of built a little company, which I guess is what I do, build a little group that accomplishes something over a stretch of time whatever stretch of time is required to do that sort of thing, and um, end up hopefully with a picture. But it's all unpredictable, and if so-and-so hadn't told me about that building, the picture would have been made somewhere else and would have been a different picture. Of course, it would never look like that, and probably those people would never have been in it. Another work upstairs that came out of, I guess, different, well, different circumstances, as they all do, but maybe a bit of a comment about um, Ivan Sayers lecturing. Ivan is an old friend of mine, my wife's. My wife and I went to lecture, hear him lecture on costume, which is what he does for, as a profession. He's a collector and a historian, and he lectures regularly. He could be lecturing here. In, this is a perfect example of where you might see him lecturing about costume, some aspect of costume. He would do it in a place just like this on a Sunday. And, um, and that's what we did. And uh, my wife and I were both struck at the same moment by the model who came out in the black dress covered with the jet um, beading and felt that it was so visual that there was a, there was a picture, was obviously a picture there. And um, so it seemed like this subject so immediately presented itself that I really didn't have to think about it very much. And I went home the same afternoon, phoned him up, and said to him, Ivan, I was at your lecture. I thought that dress was really striking. I'd like to make a picture of that moment. Should we work together? And he said, yes, well, let's work together. Why not? And we, and we did it. The rest is just the clicking of the camera part. I mean, the lecture is exactly restaged as it occurred. So we brought together an audience just like the one that was there. Just as if we said, oh, the, what we see here is going to be a picture. I need an audience, but you all go away. Then maybe I put an ad in the newspaper saying, audience required for photograph, and half of you would come back, and the other half wouldn't come back, and another group of people would come back. Well, it's kind of the same audience, but not exactly, but it, it is essentially the same audience. It, it's like that. It also, as a picture, though, addresses a kind of criticism that some people have carried on about your work that you try to control everything 
in terms of the posing and the, the meticulous construction. And that was all up to Ivan. People are always saying, I control my pictures down to the last detail. And I wonder what detail I should control them to, the, the second or third last detail. I don't really know what I would do. I think people mean maybe that there's not enough chance operating in the picture or something like that. I don't know. I'm not too concerned about that. Um, I control what I can control. And one can never really control another person. So I might make 500 shots of the same gesture, same person doing the same thing, but only one of them. There's always only one that is the right one. And that's no different from Henri Cartier-Bresson going out and shooting 20, 30 rolls of film and getting one good shot. It, all photographers probably end up with the same ratio of good pictures to not good, which I figure it's about 600 to 1 or 1,000 to 1. And, and you, I think if you take any photographer who's accomplished the body of work, you'd probably find very close to the same ratio of negatives they don't use. Um, I like the fact that Ivan was posing the model, not me. So that she's, she is for once posing. I don't pose people, I just have things happen for the camera, but the models come out, they take poses so he can explain the garment. And they'll take another pose so he can explain another part of the garment, or he'll take their hat off and look at the hat, or whatever he has to do. So she's, she's posing. Um, he's a very good lecturer, has a lot to say, and um, as you can probably surmise if you want to surmise it, any di discussion or consideration of women's clothing through history has to be a discussion of women's life and women's place in the world. And for, for many reasons, that always contains something subversive because women's position has always been what we know, what we know about it. What, I, liked about, what I, I like about Ivan as a person and one of the reasons I admire him so much is because that's his subject. To a great extent, his subject is freedom, women's freedom, or the freedom of women or the liberation of women. And that's what he's talking about in that lecture. And I believe that if people look at the picture after a while and ask themselves, what could he possibly be discussing? The gist of it will be that, even though at the moment he might be discussing the stitching of the garment or technical aspects or just enjoying the beauty of it. The essence of what he has to say is that kind of thing. And so that picture, although it seems some, somehow very um, adjusted to the world, has in it an element of discussion that I think is very valuable. I think what you've been describing over the last half hour, in a way, is, is how your photographs explore a complex relationship or complex relationships between fictional creation and the reality of everyday experience. One obviously lays claim to truth, and the other lays claim to imagination. So do you seek out, I, I think you do, when ask you to comment about how you seek out this combination of reality and fiction to create a space for our imagination? Well, I don't think I, I'm not sure I do fiction. Um, I sort of feel the term fiction is more a literary term mm -hmm. that has to do with the invention of a, a tale that does not correspond to any set of verifiable facts or something like that. I don't know whether pictures can do that because I don't know whether we have the means to distinguish between fiction and fact in a picture that is in the medium, the pictorial medium. Do we really have the means to verify that there's a divide between the two? So it's sort of vague, and I think that vagueness is part of it being a picture. So I'm not sure I do fiction, but because uh, I'm not um, going to submit to the documentary ethos of photography, even though I include it and have nothing to say against it, um, even though I, because I don't submit to it, I feel that there's no knowing where 
um, the you know stimulus for a subject or, or or the subject itself could emerge from. So there's no reason why it couldn't emerge out of a daydream or some other source. And um, and I feel those things are all all in a way equally uh, real, whatever that term term mean, term means as far as pictures are concerned. I don't know if I'm making myself clear here, but it, it just seems to me that there's no real way of um, ranking the significance in terms of their, their um, relation to the real of something imaginary, something so-called immediately grasped. It's part of the, I think it's part of the freedom that I've been talking about. I'm curious if you could describe a little bit what probably is the photograph in the show that took the longest to make. Uh, it's a five-year photograph, uh, which is uh, after spring snow. It took five years not because the picture took five years to photograph. It took five years because I learned to make inkjet prints in the process of making that piece. I originally wanted to make it as a transparency. But like an idiot, I forgot that um, photographing a white dress in a black interior is not an easy thing to do and almost beyond the capacity of the transparent medium to, to, to accommodate. So when I printed it first as a transparency, it looked so hideous. I couldn't imagine what to do at that point and it was a little bit of a problem, but intriguingly, it corresponded in time to my getting really interested in inkjet printing, which I'm doing a lot now and all the color pictures you see upstairs are either inkjets or slight variation of an inkjet the, the non-transparent ones. So the photography didn't take that terribly long. Um, the, uh, the story, in a nutshell, is that the woman you see in the car interior is pouring a little bit of sand out of her shoe. And she's doing that because she's just coming back from a secret meeting with her lover at the beach near Tokyo, and she's from a very high-born aristocratic family and happens to be engaged to a Japanese prince, so to the royal house, and of course couldn't afford a scandal, so she's hiding the evidence of what she's up to because if any sand remained in her shoe, her maids would find it and start gossiping, and so she's being very clandestine and, and um, getting rid of evidence of her wrongdoing. She's about 18 years old. The um, scene is described in the novel at the moment when the narrator, who's also in love with this woman, who's also 18 years old at the time, uh, has to turn his head in the opposite direction because she's told him she must take her shoe off to get rid of the sand. But being who they are, he would, it's, not, it's not conceivable that he should ever be looking at her while she removes her shoe. So he must look the other way out the car window. So he doesn't see it. And it's, a, it's not seen in the book, but he hears the sand fall. And, he, and he, the narrator who we follow through his entire life in the cycle of novels never forgets the sound. So it seemed like a, a wonderful moment in a great uh, novel cycle by Yukio Mishima but it was photographic to me because it's not described. It's heard only. So the relationship between the fact that the reader of the novel never sees it, it can't be described. It moves into another sense that of sound and memory seem to me to be one of those hooks, one of those stimulus that uh, just gives rise to a picture. It just as if it just the the, the picture just boils off the surface of that experience and emerges like some kind of phantom um, at that moment. And then the process to make the picture is what it prosaically ha happens to be. In that case, in this case, a rather laborious one because reconstructing another moment in time is always difficult. Please join me in thanking Jeff for a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.
right in your eyes. Right